Holler if you hear me, and welcome to tonight's edition of Art Uncensored. It is the top of the hour here, 10 p.m. Eastern, and we are here and together because we are going back into the world of Power Rangers because of the updating on the list of the guests at the Motor City Comic Con coming up at the Suburban Collection Showplace in Novi, Michigan, May 17th through to the 19th. We are going to be there, be there, be there, be there. And also someone else that will be there. I initially said, well, the guest list was updated because before then you saw that it was going to be the original uh, blue and pink Rangers. Well, 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 now the, with the updating of the guest list now, still the original pink Ranger will be a guest. But uh, if it goes the original blue Mighty Morphin will be a gone, a gone, a gone. You know, uh, guest lists and things that happen, it's still early enough before the show that they just change the listing instead of showing that person as canceled or whatever. Like what happens if somebody in the last week leading up to the show, they've got to go and leave. Like the October, the uh, last year's November uh, Motor City Comic Con where Christina Ricci back uh, was gone and canceled, like I think the Monday before. Although that does mean that now we're on a positive streak of Motor City Comic Cons I've gone to where people don't die or our guest leading up to that hasn't died, that is uh, you know, a positive development. That's, a, that, that, that's something positive. I still vividly remember the, the Tuesday that I was doing laundry, uh, that was when we saw in the news that Margot Kidder had died, and that Friday was supposed to be that weekend of the Motor City Comic Con. Luckily, now that's uh, now all in the past. And whatever else we're doing, well, so far, since we still have the Kimberly, the Pink Ranger there as a guest, that is what we are doing right here right now tonight starting with our nice little color version of her that we did before we trying to do her little classic kind of crane pose that she did when they all are posing down when uh tommy oliver first joined them as the green ranger the whole green with evil a uh, storyline that eventually led to him joining in now we've got all that up 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 and fun and i also brought out what i promised i would the other night since how uh, having seen, well, the classic version of Mighty Joe Young in response to all the King Kong stuff I've been re-watching lately, I finally uh, was able to watch the classic Mighty Joe Young from the 40s. Since the Disney version, you have to go through either Disney Plus to see that or, you know, go and get the Blu-ray. So, but what I decided instead was to simply go and, uh, you know, check out that old one with Miss Terry Moore as the lead, who was a big, gorgeous leading lady at the time, and also the wife of Mr. Howard Hughes. And it wasn't until she was in her 50s or so uh, that she wound up doing Playboy, and while I happen to have that uh, right there, along with the other one that Charlize Theron did. Yes, I did remember to bring those out for tonight. And uh, our dinosaur friend right here is certainly eager to see him. Now, when it comes to me, I am not exactly a paleontolog paleontological expert, so I could not name this one right here. I, I'm the type of basic bitch that knows, you know, the the I, I know the T Rex and I know the Velociraptor and all that. That, that. that that's how much I that's how deep my knowledge goes without having to go Google everything. Hmm. And turns out that uh, Terry Moore is actually still alive in her 90s at age 95. Although I think even now with all the weird shit in Hollywood, they're not Playboy's going to be calling her up to pose again. But then again, I'll just show you the cover. And well, that was a woman in her 50s back in the 1980s. And not exactly, uh, you know, it's just very, very nice. Very nice. Still, still, no, very, very, very nice. And that was uh, in the 80s. That was when you started seeing all those, uh, 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 those uh, shows, those prime time soap operas that had all those like actresses who were like the hot young thing in the 60s or so now having become like the middle age type of women and all of their rich people problems. Those shows like Dynasty or Knott's Landing. I believe Terry Moore was on one of those or Dallas was the, the first big one and that started in the late 70s. But then yeah. it started in the 80s to have that became a whole thing. Like the Falcon Crest was another one. And hell, Knott's Landing was also one in the late 70s, and it ran all the way into the 90s. And even remember first hearing about it on a Married with Children episode, where uh, Al Bundy goes to heaven, and he thinks he saw God's feet, so now he has a new uh, plan for God's shoes. But then he goes back to heaven, and uh, he's waiting for God there, but no, it's just some guy saying, oh, wait, no, he's busy. God is watching Knott's Landing. And then he sa Bundy says, I always wondered why that show was never canceled. Uh, yeah, ch check out, look up though, the how long 
those primetime soaps ran, and you'll see Jesus. Hell, the Dallas was the first of those, and that ran into the early 90s. No, no wonder they ran so damn long. Why would you even try a reboot? Well, they did do one of Dallas, I think, like a few years before its original star died, so they brought him back, and it only ran like a season or so, but that's still just, just, just no... Uh, well, there, there is a bunch of classic '60s and '70s TV. A lot of, a lot of the stuff that Family Guy has uh, referenced or parodied repeatedly over the years that thankfully haven't gotten any like new type of attempt at a show. Uh, the, uh, there's Gilligan's Island hasn't gotten anything like that. Thankfully, uh, there's been no Beverly Hillbillies. Bewitched would be another one. I know there was that movie that with uh, Nicole Kidman in it, but yeah, that doesn't really quite count. Or uh, the, the, Cl the the Brady Bunch. Either besides those movies in the 90s, yeah, nothing really of that, or uh, the, the Partridge Family. All the Partridge Family got was this strange type of like reality show contest thing they did on VH1, where the 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 one who the that girl who won the part of the oldest daughter on the Partridge Family, this new Partridge Family, was a young Emma Stone. Yes, back back when she was still being credited by her legal name Emily, and uh, they. Yeah, look, and also I remember the manager on that show, on that version of it, was played by French Stewart. Yeah, it was this weird thing where they had a re they had an American Idol knockoff to have the casting of who would be all the kids on there. But then after that, all the, the, the American Idol knockoff led to this is the cast of the new Partridge Family on VH1. And for some reason, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, Harry Solomon from Three Rock from the Sun was their manager. But at least none of the kids, as far as I know, are severe drug addicts. Well... But there's no new Danny Bonaducci, but we still have Emma Stone on there, and clearly she has smoked so much pole. No wonder she's been smoking away and looking like a stick ever for like the last fifteen something years. And I don't, I don't mean smoking pole like you know what what, what you see with the uh, you know uh, uh, sm smoking regularly. I mean like, <laughs> how else do you explain a lady with a supporting role in Superbad now having multiple Academy Awards to her name, unless uh, she is the sucky sucky type. Unless she's sucky sucky win Oscar, gladly. Wait, wait, wait. How many? How many dicks are you suck? No, tell me how many. How many? Uh, uh, so, 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 so something like thirty six. What do you mean something like thirty six? More like thirty seven. I'm thirty seven. Yes, thirty seven. Emma Stone has sucked thirty seven dicks in a row. There's a reason, probably why. Remember. The Weinsteins are the ones that discovered Kevin Smith with uh, the Sundance Film Festival with his movie Clerks playing there. And the immortal line, try not to suck any dick on the way to the parking lot. I bet you the Weinsteins could relate to that movie very, very well. And that's why they wound up meeting Harvey. And hello to Six Foot Sokka in the chat. We've got Sokka. We've got Sokka. We've got Sokka. So Sokka, Sokka, here it is right to you. What we've got up and ready tonight. The one and only. Yes. Second to two in the pink and one in the stink ranger. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And the poll tonight, if you see what we've got right there, is one nice simple. Would you still sleep with Kimberly? And well, so far, 67% of the vote says no. But be, uh, besides that, I also want to give you an update on what we did last night. Last night was a, a great uh, King Kong piece or pieces. And this one you see right here. This Kong and this Kong both are now for sale officially in my store. Just follow the link to my store as I post it right here for you to see. And it, they're both in the pop culture categories. So, yes, 25 for the uh, big one right here in pop culture illustrations or 30 for this in pop culture color drawings for the eighth wonder of the world. Right here, right then, right now. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And don't forget also about, well, if you like what you see right here, a $30 donation in my store will get you this piece right here, right then, right now, if you are a lover of the Power Rangers. And remember, they will go and jump in. I will ship it out to you first thing tomorrow morning with that nice little donation you make. Oh, that, that's that's less of a oh yes and a simple nice great big whoa Nelly right 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 there for the world to see because I'm feeling like I've got the world on a string tonight. 
And don't forget also about uh, these uh, right here and the offer on them that still stands with our innocent Boo there and Goku here and Broly here and Vegeta here. Oh, wait, that's a... Uh... And the last but not least, uh, our friend right here. Yes, uh, this one's already up in the store, but of course, it's a bit of a bigger price. This is 150 in my store, thanks to it being autographed by Mr. McFoley. Yes, but the, the deal of the 150 for these, for this sextet, still stands on these ones as we ship them ready to go once uh, I get the information, once I get the alarm that they have been accepted. So what has everyone else out there been doing? Uh, Saka, Lice, C, uh, uh, has uh, your woman been, uh, let's say, uh, re-acclimatizing to uh, back here in, or back where you are in California in the wake of all that time in El Salvador? I, we are all curious out here since, well, uh, you and your lady have been literally going places, so it's uh, just a little harmless curiosity on my side as the... Yes. When people say, oh, I'm going places. Well, it's nice to see somebody who actually you know, meant that literally, as opposed to somebody who will go on on about that. And then they are never, you know, uh, uh, east of uh, their local post office or something like that. Just a little curiosity there. And well, it's all good and back to the grind. Well, that's nice here because uh, there was a lot of positive response to this Kong and the other Kong from the uh, yesterday. I also mentioned about the famously how I, terrified I was of the King Kong encounter at Universal Studios Hollywood. Famously, that one, and how uh, that was a ride where maybe in the future I would do something along the lines of another Kong piece that would be dedicated to the one and only either my version of the King Kong encounter, or even do one based on the Kongfrontation ride that they had at Universal uh, Orlando, or, 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 uh, the uh, besides Universal Orlando, there's also maybe just the classic 1930s, just up atop the Empire State Building, have our gorilla friend right there. Hmm. Love the Kong, says Sokka. Well, that is great, great to hear. Love seeing what the work has done, and... Uh, immediately putting it up there. That's why I thought this is something that people would like. That's why I made sure to immediately put it in the store in those categories right there. Of course, pop pop culture, of course, right there next to the other Godzilla ones and all that. And, well, might be feeling the same about the Pink Ranger unless somebody's in the mood to uh, drop the dono to get it beforehand. A little Sir Han, Sir Han right there. And our friends... Uh, and now that I think about it, it's now the right kind of time to show you. Yes, the uh, Disney version of Mighty Joe Young was one that I remember loving as a child, seeing in the theater, watching it over and over. But then that set before it came out, as it was beating, as it was leading up, remember, I think the movie was Christmas 98. And then after that, we had a uh, leading lady in the film right here in the cover of Playboy. Although, remember... This is one where they simply found a nude photo spread she had done years before her acting career took off and simply bought it up and put it in here. And the same issue with uh, Playmates on Safari. So actually that fits. But then also David Spade and Ben Stiller. Yeah, no thank you. And put compare that to this, the leading lady from the original Mighty Joe Young in the late 40s. Here she is doing Playboy in 1984. In, yes, when she was well past the age of 50. But I mean, okay. Ninety-five now. Sure. And also in the Disney version of the '90s, she does make a little appearance in the end there, alongside the man behind the stop motion, the creature effects from the original film, Mr. Ray Harryhausen. You see the two of them together making a comment about uh about Miss Charlize right here, saying, "Oh my God, she's so gorgeous." Yes, I remember a woman who looked like that. It was you all those years ago. Uh, uh, that some a lot of those remakes have that little like inside joke kind of appearance or reference or something. Better just get it out of the way. Even even though they didn't have any of the actors from the fifties appear in the eighties version of The Fly, they still do reference the famous "Help Me" line. Although 
it's something that can go by without being that kind of inside joke where it's just all a mutated Jeff Goldblum or, or as he's mutating, he goes, help me, please help me. As opposed to the ending where it's the human head on the fly body in the web, the spider coming towards him. We, and how that became iconic to the point of even after the uh, remake being so acclaimed and successful, still the 50s version with its ending is still remembered in pop culture to be getting referenced and joked about. Uh, the Simpsons did a treehouse of horror where they make fun of that with uh, Homer, no, with Bart going in the machine that does the switching of the heads and he winds up in the spider's web. I remember that. Very, very uh, memorable, and that's nice that there's room, there's enough town. Big, the town is big enough for the two of them, for the remake and the original have some stasis. That is not a thing that regularly happens. And if it does happen in the world, well, better than to have been sadly pretty much ignored, like uh, the classic Mighty Joe, the Mighty Joe Young and its remake. Both of them are not really films that get brought up that much. I'm guessing also they brought out Terry Moore to appear in the Disney version as a little inside joke because boxing champion Primo Carnera had already been dead for years this after he appeared as himself in the original Joe. But either way, we still have a big gorilla. So let's all give one to the gorilla man. He ain't the karate man, he the gorilla man. He's the Gorilla Man, the Triller, the Thriller, and the Killer Man when you get the Gorilla Man in Manila, man. And also, you see this trusty thing right here. Well, I've been trying to get it to a detail where I am now on the final stage of my comic Tanya, Lady of the Blade, and I have now gotten back into the groove of coloring. I did. I was able to finish coloring a page today and maybe might be able to go and finish another one. Hello to Eagle Rider for the first time in a while. We have got Eagle Rider in the chat, in the chat. Hello there, Eagle Rider. Yes, I did see you were streaming earlier today. I do apologize for not being able to sh at least show up and say hello. That does... Uh, yeah, I, I don't. That is me returning the favor because I don't like that when there, there's there's other channels out there that have either helped me or if I've helped them. And then if they're doing some, they've got some content out there or I've got some content out there. And of course, they you know walk away on that favor of, you know, some bigger channel or whatever. That, that's not the kind of favor I'd want to return. It's like, it's like what I always say about whenever I'm streaming. And then, of course, you know, all these people that subscribe to me, but, oh, wait, you know, Geeks and Gamers snaps their fingers, so they're all going to run over there because, you know, uh, uh, multi-hour streams multiple times a day where it's all the same anti-Disney screaming, uh, that, 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 that draws more attention. Uh, Eagle Rider actually says, that was yesterday, but yeah, I uh, I know, don't worry, I've been super busy as fuck lately, I hate night being around more, well, I mean, all right, it's, uh, I'm still glad to have that while back, I've, I, I remember, though, those pieces I did for you of those military women, that was when I was still allowed on Twitter, yes, yes, Eagle Rider, I'm not sure if uh, you, you know, uh, but e yeah, uh, what happened was that, yeah, both uh, attempts to go and get myself back on Twitter after Eli Musk buying it up, both attempts were rejected. So, well, if anything, when I, that, that's always something I question about those people online, whether it was the comic skate circle, any other kind of circle, well, you all bash Twitter, then why are you still there? If you all call it a cesspool and you all hate it, why are you still going there? It's you, especially like content creators like that, you know you already have established bankable channels. You don't need to get you, you your work is done in trying to cult, cultivate an audience through of uh, through some other kind of social media platform so why not well uh, well uh, just just remember ego writer there that when it comes to elon musk uh, well and anybody who would call him based or whatever just remember he's pro carbon tax that's not exactly something of the uh glenn beck or uh, uh, uh let's say like any other kind of conservative thinking out there. So any type of like absolutist or free speech or independent business or not, not exactly. Just, just, just uh, remember that. And well, Eagle Rider, well, yes, I, with your case and the size of your audience, uh, she says, I know I am there, I know I am there, but I struggle without that audience. If I had the big numbers, I would dump in a heartbeat. Exactly. That's why when I see like the, that, that type of, the, the big channels have that type of thinking about Twitter and they say that, but then they act like if you're not on Twitter, you don't exist. That's one of the big things about the comic tape people that led to me walking away from them was, okay, you want to act like you're 
you, you look down on Twitter, you have all these things you have to say about the this being a cesspool or about wanting to, you know, elevate independent voices, but it seems really it's more like a PTL club for either Van Skyver, really. So that, that that's uh, what one of, one of those things I wonder about. And Igor says, I unsub I have unsubbed for most of the big channels. I just got so burned out on the warring. Well, if, it depends on either you mean either if you mean warring between themselves, especially with how Ethan Van Skyver loves to pick fights with pick any type of like pop culture against the mainstream channel that you can think of. And if they have a bigger sub count than him, yeah, he's eventually gonna pick a fight with them because that's that he has that type of fragile ego. And then there's also just in general, I can see of the like I said about geeks and gamers, it's just the dirge of I, I, as I've said when it comes to either my my channel compared to those types or to specifically like Camelot three three one. Forgive me for having something to talk about other than uh, other than bashing Disney or about working at a GameStop years ago. Yeah, as Igor Rider says, caddy BS high school drama and being obsessed with the media. Yeah, that that's a uh, with EBS and all that. It's funny how clearly him and his close circle of friends in his personal PTL club uh, really, really, really all reek of I wasn't popular in high school, and yet this is of course their chance to go and do everything they can to be the mean girls that try to gossip and backstab everybody else so that they can feel like they're the important ones. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Uh, that is uh, definitely not something I was ever a part of. Then again, that's why I was never able to fit in with any clique without eventually throwing things and screaming at them. Eventually, any kind of like in close knit social circle, me trying to communicate with them, were uh, eventually would uh, devolve into me doing a best impression of when Jack Nicholson ordered that uh, uh, chicken salad sandwich in that diner once in five easy pieces. Eventually, I'm just going to start telling people to hold the chicken between their knees and throw things. And uh, that's why uh, something that was on Discord earlier when I posted to the GCA a Discord server the uh, Kong piece I had done yesterday. Yes, yes. Speaking of, you know, oh well. For, I, I always say to people who don't watch my stuff ever, forgive me for having t a talent other than yelling into a webcam about GameStop or Disney. Well, here's an example of that: my King Kong piece from yesterday, which is now up in my art store. And the King Kong color piece I did as well. These two, right there, both in the, my art store right now. And when I posted these to that one Discord, they praised them, saying they love the expression and the motion, but also the uh, rendering of the hair. And, well, if you see the way I did the hair on Kong from last night, I did respond about how really what I did was I reappro I took an inking technique from Frank Cho, which was something that he uh, drew influence from Frank Frazetta to do. And I actually decided to bring out some visual aids to show this. This is one of the only two Frank Frazetta books I have. I remember this was uh, some stuff. I remember these were from uh, COVID uh, stimulus uh, checks. I got this, uh, the Frazetta sketchbook uh, volume two. And bookmarked right there with a trading card, and no, no, a playing card, is uh, this pencil sketch he did for uh, Tarzan in 1991. It's an unpublished Tarzan triumphant uh, uh, pencil sketch. And you see the gorilla right there. Even though it's done in pencil, the way that the lines are formed to develop those that like layer of hair, since with a gorilla, most of the body there is still that underlying anatomy of muscle and bone that with that you see with a person. But since most of a gorilla's bodies and hair, rendering the tones and the sinew and all that would be more focused on the sinew of the hair. Or if you're going to do the contours of its muscles, it would be better instead of doing it with straight lines to build it up with the volume of the hair in the body, like you see on the arm there or over there in the face. And that is how Frank Rosetta would do it. That's like the best visual a example of Rosetta I could immediately think of. From that, you get in here the art of Frank Cho, the 20 year retrospective. You see if I can find it uh, right here in the bookmark. This uh, Nike t shirt design he did in 2012 with the Velociraptors and the Gorillas. The way that the volume of hair is built up in the arms is exactly that, although because it's done in that very 
clean line style of pen and ink that Frank uh, Cho uses, it's easier to see than in that looser uh, kind of uh, preliminary pencil stage. But that way of building up the arms and the perspective and tone of a uh, hairy, hairy figure right there with that bear gorilla, you see how that's done. It's all perspective on the horse. And from there, if I can try to do this without breaking the binding. Oh, I can do it this way. Oh, yeah. You see that now. We look at that gorilla arm, and then you look at the way I did Kong, and you can see where what I was building from, where I was going from, and trying to do that character. Or at least just trying to do a gorilla in general. Since uh, in general, the two things that I have like the most, like uh, I would say, you know, fun with would be when rendering of monsters and rendering of uh, care of women, of beautiful women. That's why when a couple years back, I did that little five page monster parody called Gluten. It was a gorgeous lady running to an alley and coming across a monster in the alleys in New York City. And yes, she's a hot brunette with uh, you know, with no bra that I tried to draw like Alexandra Daddario. And uh, that sort of style, if th that's why then what I'm doing right now with Tanya, Lady of the Blade, that is a sword and sorcery kind of story that's very much in that sword of Robert E. Howard tradition, the way he would go and do his characters like that, like Valeria or uh, Dark Agnes, which was an historical uh, female sword and, uh, swordswoman kind of hero he did. Very nice. But now right here, I'm in the final stage of coloring Tanya, Lady of the Blade, and here's uh, that page right there. Got back into the groove. So here's this page colored. And then here's another one. Oh yeah, we are now up to, uh, this is page eight. Yes. So that means eight down, that means eight down 30, uh, third, no, eight down 40 to go. Yeah, 48 page comic I am writing and drawing and lettering and coloring myself. Yes. The, the, the main wardrobe that she that Tanya will be known for in the third act, I intentionally with the color scheme made it all off by having it be those kind of colors like that. Like the cape is orange instead of the crimson cape she'll be known for. The colors on her jersey are wrong. The jersey with no lacing, all, all that stuff. Very nice. But that is how we are developing things. And pretty much when if uh, any given day I am not doing some coloring on Tanya, I am also in this little book right here doing a bit of uh, develop finalizing the story for my comic Intrepids. My next comic I, I've been having stuck in my head for a long, long time. The first one I was making was Pain Machines, and I started that in uh, 2020. And then from there, I remember that summer I conceived of the idea of a science fiction story, and that became Intrepids. And in developing that back then, then I got distracted with the light bulb, the flash paper of inspiration to do a fantasy one. And well, now, last spring, I finally finished uh, Pain Machines. And right now, as we are in the middle of spring here, I'm going to be finishing Tanya. And then as soon as we are finished with coloring Tanya, uh, my spare time of coloring Tanya, I'll also be finalizing the story of Intrepid. So then when that story is finalized, I can then get into actually making it. And the way that with this story, I want it to be fully realized and fully scripted, as opposed to the way that I was much more loose with Tanya, where it was more of a Marvel method with how I had the story finalized. But with this, no, I actually am going to go when it comes to having the pages drawn. I'm going to start with the lettering. Yes, the lettering stage will come first, which is very much a non-linear way of even... If that's something that nobody I know of has ever done. Nobody I can think of has ever done a comic with the lettering as the first stage of actually making the pages as opposed to drawing, then lettering. It's always how it's been in some form or another in whatever like comic book publisher out there, whatever age of the industry, and also whatever kind of country. But since, you no, know, remember, it is all my we're doing, the Pain Machines and Tanya and Intrepids are all by my own two hands. I've got everything to look after myself. So it's a matter of I, I got to make sure to get all this right. And with this being a more precise kind of story that's exactly scripted, I'm going to make sure that it is uh, that all the, the lettering is all down there so that when it comes to doing the pages artwork wise, I have everything placed with uh, the uh, lettering and also the panel arrangements will all be in sharp focus. So when I get to actually drawing the pages, it'll be all right. I've got everything perfectly laid out. And now comes the drawing stage. 
And then from there, we get to the coloring being the final one. But that is all uh, the stages we've got. That is all the planning that we have there. And maybe also in the future, since you see, uh, if you've been paying attention to the channel long enough, how much it is of a good time for me to go do things like, you know, uh, dinosaurs or monsters in general, maybe in the future you might see a little, uh, you, you might see something, something comic book wise that would feature monsters, that would feature dinosaurs or some kind of jungle environment with some gorgeous uh, jungle woman. But that is all in the future. You know, so. uh, until then, since One Million Years BC is not exactly a movie that gets, uh, that you'd think would be available on the streaming, uh, but isn't, I'll just have to go and wait until it's um, able to go and DVR it on Turner Classic Movies like I did before and be able to actually watch it all the way through. Because the, you've got two layers of fun with that. You've got the Ray Harryhausen dinosaurs are always a, that's always great. Those great effects. But then of course you have well Raquel Welch, but she's not the only cave woman there. She's just the main cave woman highlight. Every uh, everyone else that is there, they're there. You know, the cave highlights and all that other cave women. It's just she's the one that stands out so much. To the point where to this day. Uh, Raquel Welch in that fur bikini in one million years BC is something that still gets referenced like in, well, The Flash with, of all people, uh, Ezra Miller's portrayal of The Flash having a Raquel Welch poster from one million years BC in his uh, in his build and his uh, apartment. I remember uh, Nick went to see the movie and when he came back, he told me, yeah, I, I saw there's a Raquel Welch poster in his room and I merely I thought of you. Well, when the camera's trained at me, you see what I've got, and yeah, I've got that nice little Raquel Welch 8x10 framed up. Very fun. And that's not the only Raquel Welch 8x10 I have. I actually have a couple more. Uh, some of them are like ones just related to like photo shoots she did. There's also some that are from uh, the movie Bedazzled, the, the original version with her and Dudley Moore and Peter Cook, where she's in it for like two scenes. And then in the Brendan Fraser version of Bedazzled, they basically made it that uh, they turned the devil. They, they took the Raquel Welch like glorified cameo part and the Peter Cook as the devil and made them into one character, which actually I like. That that's what that's something uh, that the the Brendan Fraser Elizabeth Hurley version of Bedazzled is another one of those remakes that deserves uh, more attention, and I would say is one of those that is like the the fly or the thing or nutty professor that it actually does a better job than the original does mainly because of the streamlined scripting right there with having okay we're gonna have the the, the movie originally in the 60s that version was made as a star vehicle for a couple of big name uh the radio comedy actors in the uk dudley moore and peter cook and well okay peter cook being the more like intellectual one of them of the two they had him as the very you know dry british humor kind of uh uh satan yes well uh well in well but of course you know because that was in the 60s so sex cells they of course roped raquel welch into appearing in two scenes as literally the in the best casting of her entire career where she literally plays the embodiment of lust and you're talking raquel welch in 1967 i think was when that version of Bedazzled came out absolutely positively correct, the correct, correct, correct casting. Very, very fun, very nice. And then from there, that well, in the movie, it's remember the that the remake came out in 2000, so that's when you could still have attractive women be attractive as leads in movies. And this was Elizabeth Hurley still, you know, in the rake of that of her in Austin Powers. This was still Elizabeth Hurley in her prime. So they have they have that same kind of you know dry British humor with her because of her accent, but also they they're able to have the fan market the movie around the fan service. That's it's everything anything. It was more efficient and honest of them, and the remake to be like that. Well, if we're gonna you know market this movie entirely around look, there's tits in it. Well, then how about we actually have you know the the, the walking tits be a, a real character instead of just show up for like a scene, but then all of the posters are gonna be about her. It's, it's not like we're prudish, it's that we just should be honest. Well then, okay, that's what that that was like the big the one big major new idea in the in the Brendan Fraser be dazzled was having, okay, well, in they streamlining the story in general of not just okay, the devil and the fan service being the same character, but also the the remake has a whole thing where 
Satan is almost like a corporation where he has all his clients. He has, you know, his employees. Like I said, the Raquel Welch cameo is her uh, as Lust, and she basically works as Satan's, uh, uh, like, like maid. But she's just one of the seven deadly sins, and all the seven deadly sins have a different embodiment that all work for him in his, uh, you know, mansion he has up in Swinging London. But with the remake, they said, okay, how about we just streamline all of that and make it we just see the devil and there's you no know, the, the devil and everybody that is just people that are enthralled by her. So when you see her like at a nightclub or when you see her out in public some other way, oh, it's just these are the just, you know, people that she deals with. There, there's even a scene where she talks about herself and the, the contract to Brendan Fraser to sell his soul and the details of I, the devil, a non-for-profit corporation with offices in hell, purgatory, and Los Angeles. <laughs> As I've been talking about the Mighty Joe Young remake being an underrated remake, yeah, the Bedazzled is just as sadly underrated and forgotten about. Some people at least might remember that because of uh, Elizabeth Hurley in that red bikini. Although at the same time, the honest marketing where we're going to sell the movie around Elizabeth Hurley's body, then actually have her be there, like the, the major role in the movie. But then at the same time, the movie almost was entirely marketed around her in a red bikini. It was in all the trailers and the posters and all that, even on the DVD. But then you don't actually see that in the movie. You promise us uh, Raquel Welch in this tiny little red bikini, but then we never see that. I mean, all the other skimpy little sexy outfits she wears are great, and they're all like some funny kind of like the devil playing pl playing with men's emotions and urges because almost every costume change she goes through, and she go through she goes through multiple costume changes sometimes in the same scene, but it's all some kind of like evil like subversion or seduction based off of some like thing that men are into. If it's not a sexy nurse, then it's like the sexy cheerleader or a sexy teacher, and like one, there, there was even a deleted scene where you get to see her as a sexy housekeeper, and like one after the other, oh, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the fan service ha is, the fan service is a theme, all right, that's, okay, well, that, that, that's a little bit more creative, uh, although you still, you built it around this idea, and you don't see it there, like at least with Raquel Welch in the remake, with that one scene of her in the red lingerie, I mean, she's still, you see her in the movie doing that, as opposed to uh, Hurley in the remake, which is like that Hammer film Frankenstein created woman, where the movie's posters and all the movie's uh, promo stills were all built around this being like a female Frankenstein monster, and all of it would be this picture of there is Peter Cushing unwrapping her from this sexy bikini made out of surgical gauze. And then you watch the film, and no such scene ever is in the movie. Like, they, they just did this photo shoot of Peter Cushing with the, the female Frankenstein monster in the movie, Playmate Susan Denberg. And yes, I do have her Playboy. Thanks to Nick, he sent it to me off Amazon, I think. And going there, you look at it and you see it. Oh, uh, but wh where is it in the movie? I mean, yeah, with, with Bedazzled, she, Raquel Welch is there for that one scene to stand there in that lingerie. But, I mean, it's still there. Like, her one million years BC, she's in that fur bikini the whole time. Especially in that piece I did last summer where it's a sexy woman with dinosaurs, and I did one of her with the pterodactyl, because in One Million Years B.C., there's the f famous scene with the goofy effects where she's getting attacked by a pterodactyl, and we see her like fall behind a rock, and it's Raquel Welch, but then we see the, the pterodactyl grab her by its talons, and it goes from being Raquel Welch to a Raquel Welch Barbie doll that's with the stop-motion figure of the pterodactyl. It's a, they call it the Texas Switch. And that's probably the most obvious Texas switch you'll ever see. It's an old, it's an old filmmaking term. That could be a thing that would happen in movies, where, where uh, you, you you would see like an act, you would see an actor or a stuntman. There'd be like a scene of maybe a stuntman falling out a window. They fall out of the window, fall out of frame, and then uh, you would see the actor uh, stepping up back into frame. Yeah, that'd be a Texas switch. Like there's a okay, stuntman thrown through the window into a garbage can, and then the garbage can lid pops up, and now oh yeah, that, there there it is. I remember seeing uh, when I used to watch the E Channel a lot. They had like a behind the scenes feature on the Dukes of Hazard movie, and they show a scene of a. Remember one of the Dukes in that was uh, was played by Stifler, and I remember they show like a behind the scenes clip of their Stifler like diving after somebody. But we, we see it's a stuntman who dives up and then falls down. And then laying on the spot right next to where that guy landed is Stiffer, who then gets up in a frame to go, I'm ready to fight. 
And hello to Grim in the chat. Nice to see you here. Uh, Saka says, that's hilarious. Well, it's funny because it's true. It's a go, yeah, Texas switch. And you'll find it hilarious. And go, yeah, look up 1 million years BC pterodactyl. Of course, remember, pterodactyl spelled with a P. And you'll, you'll see that and try not to laugh at like, oh my God, that's so obvious. But that Texas switch is a thing that happened that, that the like effects model version of the Texas switch that goes back to from the very beginning of stop motion existing in movies. It happened in several scenes involving Kong interacting with people in the original 30s King Kong, where you'll, you'll see like Kong's hand like cover up like Fei Ray or some other person. And it goes from, oh, that actor is acting with the prop. Ah, and then suddenly it's a, 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 a toy. And hello to Vanessa, right there, right there. Nice to see you back. Oh, baby. Getting in there. She had a great birthday the other day. Very, very nice. Trying to get this up here. Yes, everybody say hi to our friends right here, including our friend here, Mighty Joe Young, says hello to our friend Vanessa making a return. And well, Vanessa... Since I was thinking about the uh, remake of Mighty Joe Young lately from the 90s, the Charlize Theron version, I'll show you a little something fun that I have. Since remember, that was a remake. Both of them starred a lady that did Playboy. And yes, of course, I have both Playboys of both of the female leads of the uh, Mighty Joe Young classic and of Charlize Theron in her first big lead role. And yes, Miss Terry Moore right here was in her 50s when she did this. We enjoy that. And of course, this spread was from years before that she did some nude photo spread in South Africa that then Playboy bought up in the wake of, yeah, Christmas 98 was when Mighty Joe Young, the re the Disney version came out, and this is May 99. So, oh, hey, yeah, remember that? That, that they, Although they were a little preemptive on that since the movie, as much, as big as the, the Disney put like effort into it with the budget and marketing and all that, since I watched a lot of the Disney Channel and they heavily promoted the movie all across the Disney Channel and also seeing posters. Like I said, the, the very first poster for Mighty Joe Young I saw was another thing that scared me because it reminded me so much of the King Kong encounter where it's a painting of Joe crawling down Hollywood Boulevard, but it's all at night and the way they paint them with his eyes made him look, it reminded me of the Kong encounter. Now let's see there. I get this little belt. I don't know what she's talking about. The belt buckle right there. Oh yeah, and uh, yes, uh, I also see. I remember through a Discord uh, those uh, birthday photos that. Uh, uh, let's see right there. Yes, uh, got a few Discord DMs. Uh, let's see what they are. Oh yeah, here they are. Couple right there, just to screw those down. Now let's get this out of the way. Little detail here, and wonder where Eagle Rider went in the chat. I didn't see her around there. And it's still nice to see Eagle Rider around. I know she just said that she's been busy lately. So one of the subscribe, one of the early examples of a lady out there who really went to try and promote my channel and actually they promote to the channel where like I was still at like a few hundred or so but that was very very fun very fun very fun to uh st it was still nice to see her around because I only had a few hundred subs or so when I came across the Eagle Writers channel and she started helping me out but now I've actually like passed her like well over like a thousand something past her in subscribers. And yeah, she did make a point of, okay, if you're like a, you, you've got a channel and you're at like the couple of like, thousands at that small level and yeah, using Twitter to try to communicate with people or whatever, I, I get that and promote your stuff. Yeah. But that's the thing of with the, the, pe the people who already are well established, why would you stay on Twitter when if you hate it, it's a cesspool and all that. Why would you go and keep on doing that and doing that and doing that if you keep on criticizing it and hating everybody that's on there? I was thinking about that even... 
even when it's not related to like a nerd radical or geeks and gamers thing, I saw a wrestling channel that I follow, uh, Wrestling Bios. He did a video about his experience going to WrestleMania 40 a couple weeks ago. And he was talking about how he didn't really do any like Twitter updates while he was there in Philadelphia for WrestleMania 40 because he was because he was in such a good mood getting to go to WrestleMania and see not just everything related to WrestleMania, but he was also in Philadelphia. So he also went around, did some sightseeing at like the local zoo and this like local historical prison they have there, kind of like Philadelphia's version of Alcatraz. And, and also he went to the Rocky Steps and saw the statue and all that. And he basically said. I was in such a good mood and happy to see all these new exciting things. I didn't want to go and waste it and, you know, get my mood destroyed by going on Twitter because all, almost all of it is just people complaining about things. That That's not the thing that he wanted to go through. And remember, this is an Irish guy. This is an Irish guy from the and stereotypical. Yes, Irish guy. Well, what city do people know in Ireland? Dublin. Yes. The, a guy from Dublin coming to Philadelphia for WrestleMania. Yeah, he doesn't want to... It's a matter of not wanting to take the mood down. And well, I also, well, that, that's what got me thinking. Well, then, if you who is not involved in any of this cultural stuff or whatever at all, or anything that would lead to any kind of, uh, you know, malign thugs coming after you, like say with that umbrella guy, then why, then why do it? Especially when, uh, let's look up the number of subscribers that this guy has, that this uh, wrestling bios channel has, just to make sure. Because I saw he went back to his regularly scheduled videos. Uh, let's see. Just to show that. 391k subs. That, that is just a few thousand shy of matching that umbrella guy. So I'm pretty sure he doesn't need Twitter to promote his stuff and get his channel established. He's well, well established. And remember, that's just a good number. Remember, before then, he already has enough of following that he can afford a... Uh, luxury vip trip to go to wrestlemania uh and, and remember he's irish so traveling all the way from where he was to get out to america wrestlemania yeah that is uh oh you can tell his ends have been met and met and met well beyond whatever was uh, what you were thinking of before uh, and uh, i'm pretty sure you don't need twitter to get your name out there anymore and General T, uh, hello there to see you in the chat as we are getting Kimberly right here ready to go. No, not the one that was a woman that threw a baseball through our window one night, one day. That's one of my father's ex-girlfriends who threw a baseball through our window one day. I, I remember, I think I was actually watching Power Rangers as it was happening. Yes, uh, of course. I don't want fucking drama. I was divorcing drama. As a battered Evertonian, I can confirm they do indeed suck, says Grimm. Uh, yes. Yes, indeed. That's a, that's one of those types where that's like either there's a comp, it's one direction or another. Either it's a real test of your character and sense of loyalty, like what I say to women. Uh, for women to really find a loyal, honest man, find somebody, a man who is intensely loyal to a very terrible sports team. Because a guy like that who year in, year out will be following the same baseball, football, whatever team, and it is they are constantly losing, that is a man who is always honest and faithful, who will walk when not able, and will fight with you to the end. That's a, 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 I take that as the gospel truth. Do that, they're the kind of people who are willing to go, and that they, they do not. They are a steadfast tin soldier, if you remember that story, the... Hans Christian Andersen story. Steadfast and true, no matter absolutely positively what. Like uh, the Rocky IV, when Adrian does show up in the little cabin in Soviet Russia where they are. They cer it certainly does suck. You see, it sucks as it cuts. Oh, turn it off, turn it off. Stop it. Stop it. It's sucking my will to live. Oh, 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 you're in a forest. Forest? You're in a forest with Heather Locklear. Uh, Vanessa, it referring to Kimberly from Power Rangers right here that we're drawing tonight. The original pink Power Ranger. That's the Kimberly I'm referring to. If there's any really, uh, that, that that is entirely coincidental with whatever General T is talking about, about his wife. 
Who's the poster child for the fucking All right. Airline? All right. Let's uh, get the finger down there. Yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, the, the, there, there was the, the Kimberly on Power Rangers I'd watch, and then there would be uh, the Kimberly that, at, in a rage after my father broke up with her, smashed a baseball through our, one of our front windows. That would have been one of those days where, yes, let's go out, let's go to Universal, and the King Kong encounter won't be that scary compared to a violent, crazy woman throwing things. That little tiny window pane in the, in the dining room was $375 because it was custom. Uh, let's get that right there. Get these little shoes, trying to get them in perspective, a specific kind of perspective. Uh, yes, as you can see, data dysfunction, I am very generous to Kimberly right here. And the way you all can be generous with the link to my store. Always appreciated. Since remember, I survive or thrive based off your direct support. Since I'm not one of those big channels that sticks on Twitter, even though they bash it all the time and gets you know, hundreds of thousands of subs and gets money thrown at me from a cannon by my audience from having you know, exactly one thing to talk about. Yeah, besides actually having a creative skill, if you have any kind of creative skill on YouTube and you actually have an opinion on anything, that in general already, you know, because they want either one or the other. You have to be a completely bland channel that will just be doing the same uh, rote, uh, here's how to do this instructional kind of video, or they want somebody who will be expressing opinions that has nothing but just yelling into a webcam about one subject. But forgive me for having opinions on things that are more than just, you know, one subject. But that, that's the case of me being fresh out of fucks to give. Especially with so uh, many people out there showing the, the, the disloyalty where, okay, the other bigger party, yeah, they immediately, all that guy's got to do is snap their fingers and they run. Yeah, very, very, that, that's truly, you know, a, a guy who cares that, that they're truly, those are truly your friends, aren't they? Well, then, uh, Grim, I would just say then just avoid ever betting any game that involves Everton in the first place. If it's that difficult for you. Yes, yes. And trust me, these are not the biggest breasts I've ever drawn. You can be uh, believe me, these are not the biggest hits I've ever drawn, whether it's uh, Kimberly here, any other character. I know I've done bigger. Hell, I, I, going back to the dinosaur stuff, I remember that summer I gave bigger ones to when I drew Denise Richards and Tammy and the T-Rex. And, and remember, that was before Denise Richards implants, if you remember that movie. Uh, now, ooh, rainbow in the dark. Oh, yeah. Now let's cap these ones there. And yes, uh, my father's done the same thing with his lions for 30, 30 years. That is the type. And we've got uh, Donnie right here uh, helping everyone's having a more phenomenal day. I'm Actually, now Donnie's showing up now. It surprised me that it, it took him this long to arrive uh, during a Power Ranger stream. But he's here now, so I knew he would show up at some point. Get this clean. Oh, yes. And now, for some reason, reminded of the Captain Planet bit from... It was Ted Turner putting himself in body paint as Captain Planet on Robot Chicken. Captain Planet! Captain Planet! What is that? Is that Ted Turner? Was he on one of those zip lines? Psh, Captain Planet, you got glass in my eye and my foot and your balls. Protect the environment or I'll fucking kill you. Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Eating good in the neighborhood. Isn't that uh, Outback Steakhouse's uh, catchphrase? Oh, no, it's Chili's. Yeah, it's Chili's. Sorry. I got the name wrong. Oh, mama. I want to make me chubby chucker. A little chubby chucker with cheese. Oh, baby. I want to make me chubby chucker, mama. Oh, mama. Oh, mama. Mama, I'm dying. I'm dying, mama. I want to talk to chubby chucker.
And with uh, Donnie in here, let's give him a look at what we did last night with King Kong. And uh, this boy, and this boy, trying to get them both in frame. Oh, yeah. Oh, whoa, he, yeah. Big man, ain't he? Uh, big one. Definitely, you can tell this is the kind of guy who would definitely agree with me that out of all the women and all the versions of Kong, that Jessica Lang was the hottest. You can bash the 70s version all you like. Yes, it deserves everything from the lack of the dinosaurs to just the uh, all the other story changes that dated to the 70s and flash freeze it at the time. Then, of course, there's the ending change. Even if 9-11 never happened, changing the location of the ending to the World Trade Center just in general would have been a big, like, you know, just uh, uh, arbitrary movement, arbitrary difference. But, and then, also that and the weird way where it looks like Kong wants to bang Jessica Lang when he gets her, he gets her all muddy and then puts her under the waterfall and starts blowing on her and she looks like it's turning her on. Yeah. Uh, if you found that hot, just say so. Of Kong blowing on, of, on a sopping wet Jessica Lang who seems to enjoy it. No wonder that version of her character uh, seems like she was being sent on a yacht to go off and do porn because the, the woman got turned on with a giant gorilla. I'm pretty sure she would have been the kind of woman that would have been okay with porn. From the same actress who went on to win multiple Oscars and do Shakespeare. Yes. There, there, there'd be a fun double feature. Look at the 70s King Kong with Jessica Lang, and then compare her acting there to her role in Titus. The... Uh, yeah, I know she also was in the 90s DiCaprio, Romeo and Juliet, but that's like a sm small part compared to her being the female lead in Titus. And she's holding her own against Anthony Hopkins. Although he does wind up tricking her into eating a pie baked from the flesh of her sons. Yes. Can you tell why Titus Andronicus is the favorite Shakespeare play of Marilyn Manson? Yes. He... A, the title character kills his enemy sons, bakes them into pies, and then tricks the mother into eating them. Well, there, there, there's hardcore revenge, and then there's that. I don't even think, like, in the most depraved moments of imagination of the characters from Dirty Work, where they kill some guys and then trick a woman into eating uh, their flesh from a pie. The worst they did was they accidentally led to some drug dealers gunning each other down in cold blood when they're hiding fish all over the house of some mansion, and it turns out they're drug dealers, and they, they all freak out over noticing the fish. They think it's some signal, so it leads to a giant shooting rampage. <laughs> Behind you! Say hello to the devil for me! Right there! Oh! Oh, he's killing me now with a chainsaw! Oh, he took my chainsaw, and now he's using it on me! Oh! What, is that a hand grenade? Boom! All right, this noise has got to stop. What? What? I didn't, I didn't ask you to do this. Hey, uh, could you pay us now? Uh, time to play the fiddler, whore. Yes. You bit my new nose off. Blah, 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 blah. When I say go, you go. You shut your cake hole, Yoko. Ah, uh, women. A fat guy in a little coat. A fat guy in a little coat. The fat guy in a little coat. Fat guy in a little coat. If I was going to talk about one million years BC so much on this stream, I would have gone and also brought out the Raquel Welch Playboy, but we can always do that for later. As we see, uh, at this moment, this what does my third comic look like? Well, so far we've got this. You've got a. We got the notes right here going, but we are developing more and more. And it's the basic uh, plot beats that need to be organized and really properly put in shape and then go in and properly do the script that is moment by moment and street by street and beat by beat. We got to uh, sense, I want this story to be a full script for uh, Intrepids. 
and to get everything in the right tone, in the right shape. Since even with the Marvel method or whatever, the lettering will always be done after the artwork is drawn, but I I'm breaking new ground and altering the deal. I'm, I'm altering the deal of how you make a comic. Pray I don't alter it any further. Although in the future you might see me doing something involving some uh, naughty, naughty, uh, uh, naughty girls, naughty cave girls, uh, dealing with dinosaurs or maybe large gorillas, maybe some talking gorillas. However, it is you feel like it, especially with my love of the work of Frank Cho right here. That would include things, well, just look at the back cover. You got some funny animals with a cheerleader right there. That's very nice. Since I've always liked the cheerleaders out there. If anyone else out there in the chat is into the cheerleaders, just say so. Ooh, a very nice first just page randomly cracking open. And we get a great example of a jungle woman. Very sharp. Very pretty. And also pretty and also with muscle. Muscle tone, at least. That, that, that's still what separates the men from the boys when it comes to Frank Cho's work is that he draws attractive women, but also he can draw the type of women that are in shape with muscle tone, but not make them look like some kind of purposely make them look like an ugly dude out of spite. You know, none of that Starfield, Star Wars Outlaws kind of stuff. Just look at the way he puts here with this cover he did. With uh, we got the blighty Black Panther Storm and the Invisible Woman with all those trees and all those leaves behind them. Very nice. And yes, uh, Frank Cho also has drawn the Princess Leia in the slave bikini. Where, wherever it is, I'm trying to look for that. Oh, here, here's a great example of him with the... Look at, he, he's the kind of guy, yeah. When it comes to Wonder Woman, there's two ways that they draw her. They draw her like a lady with muscle or they make her look like a beauty queen. And here, yeah, he's going for the fitness model look instead of the look of, uh, you know, Linda Carter. And whatever is going on with the DC Universe reboot, we still have no idea, what. Uh, at least as far, as far as I know, no idea what is becoming of Wonder Woman. I don't think Gal Gadot's going to be coming back, but who is going to be in her place? I don't know. I don't see. But remember, the this, this Superman movie that's supposed to be the start of it all is really, really over the top with uh, going on and going on with this stuff and that stuff with all these different parts. You know, we've got this Supergirl actress cast. We've got this story cast. We've got all of that going on. And yet what is uh, happening here or there? I don't know. Just trying to understand what uh, the story is. You no, know, oh, the places that they are supposed to go, but all right, superhero movies are tired in general, but that's not the strangest thing that Warner Brothers has done. Remember, there's a second season of Velma that's, I think, supposed to be coming up next week. Velma is getting a second season. Are you kidding me? And then from that, there's another great piece. This is all in pen and ink. Look at that rendering right there. Beautiful and in great shape. Although still, I would say that Linda Carter had nicer breasts. If you saw that movie she did where she's some Southern belle and she's always in like little tied off tops, I can't tell you what it is. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but just like Google image search Linda Carter and you'll see some still images from the movie of her in this like tied off top. It's like the other image results you get of her from the 70s that aren't from the Wonder Woman show. But they are always fun. And uh, she just, 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 just spank her and it makes you want to spank her and pull her hair and make her confess to being a bad girl. Or at least that's what I would like to do because pulling a girl's hair and spanking her and making her confess is just a fun thing. And other things I know that women out there in my audience, when they do show up, like to hear. Just, just say yes, Vanessa, if you like uh, if you like that, to have your hair pulled and getting spanked. Or any any other woman out there, maybe even Daily Dysfunction showing up. Uh, I know they do. It's just a matter of them confirming it on the stream. If you like the punishment or you need someone to punish you for being naughty, then it's a matter of just confirming, just saying so. 
Well, Vanessa says uh, simply, I missed it. Uh, missed uh, what? Did you mean that you, uh, uh, whether or not you admit to, uh, you enjoy spanking? You you miss getting punished for being naughty? Is the, the context exactly? That is what we're all curious about. Oh, well, Vanessa, the, the question is whether or not you or any, do, this is to all the women in the stream, do you enjoy getting punished for being naughty? Because uh, so, to, uh, me and Six Foot so so Sokka would both like to know if you uh, like to be punished for, if you like getting punished for being naughty. We are all eagerly awaiting your answer or all the answers from all the women in the chat. Well, actually, surprisingly, Vanessa says no. So either we're all pleasantly surprised or Vanessa's just in denial about being a bad girl. Still better than that California state assemblyman who, like about eight years ago, he was gloating about his mistresses uh, during the middle of a state assembly but he had a live microphone on him. And it wasn't until he started going into detail about spanking these women that then someone came over to him and said, your mic was on. And you see, this is the finished results of tonight. And if you like either one of these pieces, just follow the link to my art store in the chat and a $30 donation will get you either one of these two or a $50 donation will get you both. So then when you drop that dono, I will then go and uh, I will ship them out to you first thing tomorrow morning. And it will be the subject of a new Luke Goes Postal video for one beauty or another. In uh, her crane pose. Yes, it's from, well, the stock footage of the, flat, of the final episode of the Jason David Frank debut. Of all of them together. And also with uh, the Dragon Dagger. The dragon dagger that brings in the dragon zord. And I know somebody out there has made a copy of the dragon zord that actually can go and play. Like, like you can play it like it's a flute, like they do on the show. Either that year of Super Sentai or of that year of Power Rangers. Very elegant and very nice. And I haven't done the Pink Ranger in, I think, like a year or so. So this, uh, it, it feels like riding a bite. I like a bike. Or yes, Sokka, the, the meat flute. So, the, 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 the people out there, I wonder how many of my women in my audience have played a meat flute before. I know my mother, well, she was a, she was a, a gifted flautist, but, uh, but basically the skills were transferable when it came to fellatio. What's the, what's the Sokka out there saying no to Sokka? What's that? Or uh, he said, said the word. yes, the meat flute, but no, not my father's. And apparently Henry Mancini was a flautist as well. Well, uh, I uh, wouldn't know. You have to, uh, my, my father might would have known, but I don't think, uh, or maybe my mother, but not me. That's, that's all news to me. And also to our gorilla friend right here. Although Hank was a cool dude, according to my father right there. So we do have that, okay? Because Mancini was friends with the, the director, Richard Donner, he worked with all the time. So that, that's one of those six degrees of separation. Same thing with coming across Rick Derringer and Ronnie James Dio at the same party at uh, Jack Haley Jr.'s house. And there they both were. This was... And this was, D, uh, this was Dio in the middle of his solo career after he quit Black Sabbath, although he had been before with uh, Rainbow, from Rainbow to Black Sabbath, then his solo career, and then the, the uh, I think it was uh, terminal cancer that killed him, because damn it, that was a terrible, terrible moment, a sad, sad time for him and for well, the whole world out there. And also it speaks to Ozzy Osbourne's like f genetic freak status that he's able to survive all those drugs. Well, who died today, I showed all those drugs he beat and, uh, and he's still living on and the guitarist for the Allman Brothers died at age 80 today. He's the of the and, Brothers. and the Allman Brothers, they were, and, and the Allman Brothers, they were not like, uh, they did not party anywhere near the level of any metal band. They were not 
like like uh, Ozzy Osbourne snorting ants off of the ground or licking up uh, Nikki Six's piss or shitting on the floor of a hotel room and then painting the walls with them and shit. Greg Allman was a junkie. That was, he ended up marrying Cher. That was, that was more of a that that's more of an Ozzy Osbourne Motley Crue kind of thing. Where I I know there's that Netflix movie about Motley Crue, The Dirt, that came out a few years back, and they're showing the the. And they were showing like a scene that was a montage of uh, Tommy Lee and his like day in the life of him on tour, where he wakes up at seven o'clock at night and then he gets out there. He's all zoned out. He's getting a blowjob backstage. Then he goes on stage and with so much adrenaline as he's playing, then he gets out of that. He starts going and breathing in artificial oxygen, then gets so hammered, so shit faced, pancreatic cancer. Yes. And then from there, he, while burning down his, uh, trying to burn down his own hotel room, his manager punches him in the face and handcuffs him to his bed and leaves the key there on the bedside so he can go be able to uncuff himself to wake up to get ready for the next show the next night. Because that's what it was like in the, a day in the life of Motley Crue. And remember in the 80s, Tommy Lee was married to Heather Locklear, so he had some extra special help. And also, well... Hmm. For for all the talk of how big of a guy that uh how big of a how crazy and slutty that Pam Anderson was, look at her personal life and all that, and how she is with whatever substances compared to Heather Locklear, Tommy Lee's first uh, uh wife, and how she's like a late fall down drunk who's had this problem and that problem. Substances and uh, while uh, I. I don't think that Jim Pam Anderson is any kind of like sober Sally, but she's definitely never needed to go in and out of rehab or she's never had any of that kind of problem. Yes, she, her, her, her personal problems, personal demons are with bad taste in men and, uh, and, and falling into like the wrong kind of relationship instead of getting high or drunk. Well, Heather Locklear, who was this big, all pretty, nice, pretty and nice looking TV star, you know, who had two major TV shows at the same time. You now she's the one that's had the problems with getting DUIs and the, the, the mug shot that looks like shit. Just saying. It's another example of what I've mentioned about the, the type of women that are always look at the, the pretty blonde, like a Pam Anderson or like Sydney Sweeney today and want to shit talk them and bash them. And then you'll take a good look at the kind of Tina Fey type of women that would bash them and then see whether or not they are, you know, all, all, you know, restrained if you gave them the chance to go and bone around with dudes or how their personality really is compared to those type of women or IQ levels compared to those type of women. I'm pretty sure they would not be the type that would be all kinds of, you know, shitting and screaming and angry. Or uh, and they, they would be supremely shitting and screaming and angry while the women they make fun of would be nothing like that. But it's just a matter of neuroses and anger. It's, a, it's, it's the, oh, the people, the kind of people to whom cannot get past their high school neuroses, their high school insecurities, so they wind up lashing out. Uh, E.G. Carol Baum, the producer that was bashing Sidney Sweeney at some q and <laughs> for some movie she produced and saying about, I don't get how attractive she is. Well, remember a woman like that, who's been around the business that kind that as long as a woman like Carol Baum, probably when she sees some pretty new thing coming into town, her immediate mindset is to go and be like all happy of, Oh, I know she'll be in the spotlight to then watch as she withers away and ages and mm -hmm. no longer will she be the it girl and how to forget her. And I'll be around to laugh at her. Ha <laughs> ha. It's basically the kind of thinking that they have. I mean, I, I would not be surprised if that is the thinking that they have. And that, that's, or as I said in my video about the little situation today, she basically has that idea of, you know, the, the meat grinder of the business, the way things come and the way things go. And that you'll have a here today, gone tomorrow, while those kind of women like a Carol Baum or a Kathleen Kennedy, unfortunately, yeah, they pretty much stay around, stay around because they've got so much of the connections to the beyond the line people. Not above the line or below the line, they're beyond the line. You don't see their name on the credit. You see them there running those studios in charge of the credits. They, 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 they are the ones who do not face those type of problems that uh, an actor or an actress or a director whose career is this peak and valley of highs and lows. That's why it. Uh, I feel stupid for 
taking as long as it took for me to understand that uh, old Victor Van Doomcock was just a dipshit of it took like a year and a half of him promising Kathleen Kennedy is going to be fired from Lucasfilm and still nothing happened, still nothing happened. Until then, wait, as long a woman has been around in the business as long as she is, yeah, she could walk up in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and Disney would never fire her. She is above reproach. Yes, there is such a thing as that in Hollywood. There are those type of people where they have, they've been around for so long and they're so well connected. Anything short of having evidence that would lead to Hillary Clinton's arrest will lead to them. They will never face consequences and never lose whatever it is they don't want to lose. Uh, KK, will, she will be with Lucasfilm as long as she wants. While silently probably, at least with her probably being smart enough to just be in her office while belittling and slut-shaming Sidney Sweeney for daring to be a woman that does not fit the, uh, the, the Kathleen Kennedy South Park meme. The same reason that those, uh, the all NFL drafts coming up, those same idiot uh, ESPN experts that always say about what quarterback's going to be so great, and then they always wind up falling apart. And then they get egg on their face when a guy like Tom Brady, who they all insulted and said, he doesn't have the arm, he doesn't have this, he doesn't have that. Well, he has seven Super Bowl rings, so uh, not just old Tommy Boy, but my gorilla friend right here would disagree with you. And with the NFL draft coming up, I may or may not be doing some NFL-related artwork for, like, major prospects. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, we've got the NFL draft happening next weekend downtown, and that is something that does not... It starts Thursday. It, it's, it starts Thursday, and that does not happen every... That does not happen at all. This is the first time it's been in the city. Usually, they would always have it at Radio City Music Hall, but now, in more recent years, they've been moving it up and down from one major city to the next. And well, with the, how much gentrification has been going on in downtown Detroit of so many New Yorkers, it, it'll basically, it'll be like the country song Feels Like I'm Home with how it's always, it had always been in New York for the longest time. Well, with so many in the past decade, New Yorkers are moving out of the city and moving into Detroit because it's so much cheaper to live here well, and building it up and building it up into their image. Yeah, uh, it won't be that much of a difference. It's so cheaper to come down. As I, I mentioned about uh, so much of downtown Detroit does resemble Manhattan in some way or another of the, when it comes to locations and parks and fountains or there's a hotel that I swear is the one-to-one -one of the Plaza Hotel as made famous from you know Home Alone 2 or maybe the Eloise books if you know that better. Uh, th think about it. Think about that if you wind up seeing 620-somethings dancing in a fountain to the Rembrandts, if you remember uh, Friends, which... I only ever saw a few episodes of, and well, I don't. I understand why people don't like the show, but I, I, I understand people who like or dislike the show intensely. I was one of those where, okay, I'm not into this. I don't despise it, but I'm changing the channel. I could get into Seinfeld, but can't get into Friends. That's that's where I draw that line. That, that that's who are these people? Uh, I to, to think uh, like Seinfeld himself. I just go. Who, these people that see the friends and they love it. Who are these people? And at least with Jerry Seinfeld, you also have the great impression that Gilbert Godfrey used to do of him. Like I, uh, for all of how Godfrey, you know, the, the loud voice and the, the edgy jokes he would do, one thing that doesn't get meant, beloved as much about him was his great way of impersonating other comedians that he, were, he was friends with, like Andrew Dice Clay. He'd go on there with the... Yeah. With the the hotel Statler is the name of that hotel that looks like the plaza. Mine, mine was called Statler Hilton. And the it, it, the uh, Gilbert Godfrey doing the Andrew Dice Clay voice. He'd have the jackets. He have the hair. The little smoke up there. You know the oh wow 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 wow. You know. Little <laughs> Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider. It sat down beside it and said, "Hey, what's in the bowl, bitch?" It's a little fun today, no? Three blind mice, see how they run. Three blind mice, where the fuck are they going? You know, little boy Boo. He needed the money. Jack and Jill went up the hill, each with a buck and a quarter. Jill came down with 250. Oh, she was a whore. That's a... Oh... Al Pacino, I fucked him. Oh! 
That's just a little bit there of the dice man. Oh, you don't understand. I just wanted to be held. Well, then you got the deluxe package. What, you need a cab fare? There it is, on the dresser. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, you don't, you don't understand. I've got a boyfriend. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I fucking love that. Yeah, yeah. You know, right there. I just was just thinking, you know, maybe these days I'd be married to something more advanced, like maybe an amoeba or something. Hey there, honey. You know, I was thinking maybe if I get really good at sex, I won't have to give up half my shit every five fucking years. Oh! Uh, that's, what, that's what I was thinking a little bit, maybe. you know, Lesbians are our friends. Uh, I was saying, men, don't be, don't be mad at lesbians. Lesbians are our friends. You know why? Because they can teach you. They can teach you things about a woman's body. And make that woman happy so that then you don't have to go through everything I do. Oh, come on. This is new love. I wouldn't lie to you three times in a row. Come on, asshole. Come on. Oh! Right there, doing drugs, pun flowers in the hair, listen to their goddamn beta albums. Ha! Oh! Why don't we go and bomb those rice eaters back to the goddamn Stone Age? Why is it Sayed? 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 All right, I'll say it. It's because Picasso is too much of a pussy to smack those commie bastards. That's right. That's right. I like you. Oh, he, he really cares about what I don't know. Oh, 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 you know what that, you know right there, mm -hmm. no, yeah. the only time, I know when I was a child, never had any fun, uh, a girl called me up once, said, come into a house, there's nobody home, I went to a house, there's nobody home, when I was a boy, you know, I was so ugly, my dog put me in a dog show, I won, oh, you know, when I was born, I was so ugly, the doctor slapped my mother, you know, one, one one time, one time, yeah, you know, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know, the, you know life, life is rough, you know, life is rough out there, you know, uh, you know well, I, this morning I decided to go and do push-ups in the nude. I didn't notice the mouse trap on the ground. You know, my new movie out there, you know, Siskel and Ebert saw my movie, they each gave me one finger up. <clears throat> no. Yeah, you know, uh, my father, you know, this, uh, if you wonder if my father's in all those forms of social media, no, no, this is it, this is one thing. He, he comes here to be a mod, he comes here to have fun with all you people, and that's it. Uh, as my father says here, you know, uh, if, uh, if my father wanted to be annoyed and hear Moana crap, he'd call his ex-wife. That, that's what the ex-wife is for, Moana crap. He'd, he'd rather go and learn new, th about, he'd rather go and be a little bit more informed, a little bit more educated, like, you know, maybe one of our dinosaur friends right here, you know, he's a... Uh, you know, that boy, you know, he was in that generation. He was never really into dinosaurs. And I was, uh, you'd see them, uh, you know, there'd be things out there in museums or in schools educating you about them. Uh, there'd be shows, whatever, educational shows about there for the kids about that stuff. But, you know, the, by that time, the only time he was ever interested in anything with dinosaurs in it was one million years BC. But at that age, it was all for Raquel Welch back there, nothing about the dinos. You know, when it came to Jurassic Park, oh, yeah, he went to see Jurassic Park to bring his kids there, and then he fell asleep the whole time. I guess you begged to run with me. Who? Has to do with Jurassic Park. Oh, what, Jeff Goldblum? No, Bruce Dern. Oh, yes. Oh, that, 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 that's uh, another little bit right there. You know, uh, like last summer was the 30th anniversary of Jurassic Park. He, you know, oh, hey, you know, it's great to see. He's like, no, no, no. If I want to see dinosaurs, I'll just look at your mother. I think maybe that's why, you know, he never had that kind of interest in the dinosaurs as a child or whatever. He never had that. And in his mind, a woman that was 26 years old is a dinosaur. Why would he want to go and go into the museum with the skeletons and study them that way? They all look like skeletons to me the second they turned 30. Years, years ago, what can you say about your mother's arms and a sleeveless shirt? Uh, well, one time when my... One, one three-letter word. Begins with W. My... Uh, my... Girl, my father's girlfriend at the time saw his ex-wife there, and he saw her arms, and he my he simply asked my father why, her dangling, dangling, uh, flapping she's, uh, triceps. She's twenty-one and super fit, and your mother was I don't know fifty. A twenty-one-year-old fit woman looking at my mother, and I actually uh, uh, I would like to remind I would like to inform you that sometimes when we'd be driving with my mother, she'd be wearing short sleeves, and I actually would pass the time by flapping her distended uh, triceps. But she wasn't gigantically fat, she was just soft. She, my mother was never fat or anything, she just was oh, very soft. 
But with that, I'd be, I would literally be doing that with my mother's, uh, this, my mother's dangling for, uh, dangling uh, triceps, just, just flapping. We. This guy is the new co-owner of the NHL team. He looks hmm. like a dude. He looks like a guy. He looks like he'd be part of Geeks and Gamers. Yeah. He's the new co-owner of the Utah team. They uh, paid two billion dollars oh. for Salt the Salt Lake team. Yeah. That that, but you know, with my, with my father, no social media, no problem. He can still go out there and still, you know, uh, anybody that wants to go, you know, bust his traps, you know, just take care of them like that in person. Try that rent sauna attitude towards him, and you know, uh, yeah, you scream your head off in a Taco Bell drive-through. He'll put it into that in a few seconds. Or, or, or uh, things like that, like whenever it comes to being in public or like at uh, at the casinos downtown, the sports books they have there. We think we have uh, the sports books all next week. Although, of course, the, 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 if, we were able, if we were able to get to downtown next weekend, it would be, yeah, it would be so exciting and crowd of so many people. 46, 2, be, it, it would be even bigger and better than uh, what happens downtown when I go to Yumacon. Yumacon will be child's play compared to what's happening this next weekend with all the people over there. Well, I'm giving credit. He founded his own company, Qualtronics. Qualtronics? What is it? I'm, I would say electronics. So the executive chairman and co-founder of Qualtrics. Oh, it's actually Qualtrics. Oh, Qualtrics. Mm -hmm. But is it some insurance company, maybe? I don't really say. That was, uh, you know, it'd be also fun. Uh, I've talked about the Detroit Zoo last night, how all the years I've lived here, and no one's time I've ever come close to the, Detroit, Detroit, to the Detroit Zoo is driving past it on the way to Motor City Comic Con and walking past it one time when I had to make a deposit at the nearest Chase Bank. Oh, and, uh, well, if we were able to get one of the gorillas from the Detroit Zoo and have them go around downtown during the NFL draft, that would be hilarious. Oh, you also you fuck jazz. Hmm. I also like to see if the gorilla could actually climb any of the buildings. Wouldn't you love to see a gorilla really climb like Chase Tower, downtown Detroit, or the Renaissance Center, or the, the new Hudson building that now is going to have a, a, a part, both hotels and apartments in it? I'd love to see that. I'd love to see it climbing the top of the Hudson Tower, and there would be a real gorilla. Well, there's a list of movies that use the Penobscot Red Bull. Like a, or the Penobscot building. That would that, be fun. Though. Because in uh, Vanessa, I was wondering if you remembered in the 80s for the 50th anniversary of King Kong, the city actually put an inflatable King Kong on the top of the Empire State Building as a way to commemorate the anniversary. But then because of the wind and the chill factor up there, the balloon wound up popping under the weight of the wind, under the winds, this uh, King Kong inflatable pff, detonated. If you remember, if you remember seeing that at all, just say so, like a uh, when we asked earlier about the, the New York blackout in 77, if like you or your family knew anything about that, if you would all remember, you and your family ever remember the inflatable King Kong they put up atop the Empire State Building. Just a, just a, just a you know, little curiosity of, hey, you know, I'm just a, I'm a curious man. I'm a curious boy. You know, that's why as a book, you know, uh, I always loved Curious George. Now, you know, I was, you, know, but you know what I was curious about, unlike Curious George? I was curious if my father was ever going to let me out of my cage at night. That's it. You know, I had a different name, but I decided to change it. You know, if you have a different kind of name, you have a mind, just change it. It's fun. <laughs> uh, during sex, I lose my place. No respect. No respect at all. It's not easy being me. Oh, yeah. It's a little thing I have here. You know what else is a little thing that's surprising? Whether or not you would still sleep with Kimberly, the bet is now deadlocked at 50. 50-50, I did not, not, not expect that we would have that. That is an honest-to-God surprise. As my uh, wrist there is crackling a little bit. But, you know, we, we, we've got to, we 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 got to get a little bit of a little fun over here. You know, uh, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know, uh, well, what's going over here? You know, what's going over here? Yeah. You got your Pepsi ready? You, you're going to go some barbecue tonight, baby? You're going to barbecue a little? Maybe? Maybe not? But now I see, I see that right here, right now, this is the last call for Super Chats or channel memberships or donations into my store. Here is uh, the link to my store. One last time for all of you to see. This was a good, good night. And also let's all give you one last look at uh, the Pink Ranger right here that we did. Oh yes. 
There we go. A little bit of that. Der, do, 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 do. Very pterodactyl like, isn't she? Very beautiful. But hey, still very, very nice, ain't it? And remember, if you like these, just follow the link to my store and donate 30, you'll get either one of these. Or if you donate 50, you'll get both. And also the new, the King Kong art from last night is now officially up there in the store for sale. There will be a community post of it as well, 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 as right now we are in the middle of writing Intrepids while coloring uh, Tanya, getting all these things going, moving up, 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 up at once. That is very, 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 uh, very, very uh, nice, nice, nice to see. Yes, yes, yes. A little bit... Just give a little bit, give a little bit of my love to you. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. And this little night, as we got a little fun. This little detail right there. And well, 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 beyond that now, I want to thank you all for watching. Subscribe so my channel will reach 10,000 subscribers this year. Don't forget to become a channel member today. And uh, the memberships start at $2.99. I also want to thank Third Men Out, who a couple days ago became our first general level channel members. Yes, yes, yes. There is a there is Sergeant, Captain, and General are the three levels of channel memberships. And third man out, a friend of the channel, made a nice comeback. I, I didn't, see, he must have done it after the stream was done. But yes, I, I looked over the memberships and yes, now third man out is our first top tier, third level, yes, gen, or as it's called, a general level a channel member right there. So thank him for that. But besides that, also with beyond becoming a member or uh, super chats, you can also go and make a donation in my store right now. Follow the link to my art store, and besides, yes, you can donate, because when you donate, that money goes directly to me in my store instead of YouTube. Don't forget you, besides buying or commissioning me, and if you want to buy or commission my work with Live Outside of America, just add up what you want in U.S. dollars with another 25 U.S. for the international shipping fee, and your items will ship immediately. So tomorrow, my shorts will premiere at 5 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 and 6. My video premieres at 6.30, and I'll be live again at 10. So felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.